Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. If you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so again by going to Amazon or Kindle. Or go go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a thousand pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Go to findinggeniusfoundation.org and check out our current initiative, which is studying anxiety and depression. We're working on creating a compendium of uh, most, if not all, of the knowledge available on anxiety and depression, and this to be available for people that uh, are suffering from the condition or have friends or loved ones that are. So go to findinggeniusfoundation.org. Today, my guest is Julian Barbour. He's the author of a book called The Discovery of Dynamics. He completed a PhD in 1968, and he's collaborated with uh, researchers in academia. Discovery of Dynamics, we're going to get into it. it. It goes over Newton's great discoveries at the end of time and other physics topics. So Julian, thanks for coming. Pleasure. Yeah. Well, tell me about uh, this book. What was your reason for writing it, and what's the book about? Well, the book is uh, was written. I started writing it in about 1982. It really came about the actual book, The Discovery of Dynamics, by accident. I had been very interested for a long time in the since 1963. I'd got very interested in what's called Marx's principle, which is trying to find an alternative to the foundation of dynamics that Newton had created. Newton introduced the concepts of absolute space and absolute time. He said time flows uniformly without relation to anything else. And he likened space to, I suppose, an invisible block of ice through which things could nevertheless move in straight lines at a uniform speed. And that, for him, was the foundation of dynamics. And then objects just deflected each other from these straight uniform motions that Newton put at the foundations. And that was already challenged in Newton's age by Leibniz, and then much more seriously by Ernst Mach in the 1870s, 1880s. And he wrote a very influential book on the history of mechanics in which he said, these local motions, these local inertial motions that were the foundation of Newton's theory were not determined by an invisible space, but must somehow be, be, be determined by the masses of the universe. So, Quick question. You said Ernest Mach. Was that, is that the fellow that came up with the Mach speed, Mach 1, 2, etc.? That's right. He was a brilliant experimentalist. And he took these flash photographs in, I'm not quite sure when it was, around the same time as he wrote his book, which showed these shock waves. It was after the um, Franco-Prussian War in 1870, because that was when people started getting 
that's when the when the first supersonic shells and that gave rise you heard the soldiers heard two bangs one when the when the explosion happened when the shell landed near to them and then after that the bang as it had left the cannon cannon several miles away and mark was thinking about that and that's led to the discovery of shock waves so he was a brilliant experimentalist so anyway i got very interested in this and also what is the nature of time and I'd been very lucky. I, my first paper was published in Nature in 1974, and that led to a very fruitful interaction with a, a very good Italian experimental uh, theorist, theoretician called Bruno Bertotti. And we worked together and we developed what I think can be said to be, it, we realized Marx's principle. I think we worked out the mathematics of it. We showed that Marx's idea was very plausible and it led to the right answer. And moreover, we, we were able to show basically that really at the heart of Einstein's general theory of relativity, it was sitting there, but in a very disguised form. Anyway, so that's the background. And then I thought it would be very nice to write this up. So I sent a proposal to the Cambridge University Press to write a book about this, the history of it from Newton up to Einstein, plus the work that Bertotti and I had done. And I got a contract to write this book. And just before I started to write it, I said to myself, well, perhaps I should ask, why did Newton say what he did say? Where did the idea of absolute space and time come from for him? So I said, I'd better look at Galileo. <laughs> Before I knew, I was back with the pre-Socratic, pre-Socratics in ancient Greece and got completely absorbed by the whole history of, of the development, particularly of ancient astronomy from the ancient Greek astronomers through Ptolemy, who was the last great Greek one. He published his great work, the Almagest, in about 150 of the modern age, BC, uh, AD, as I call it. Julian, quick question here. So I know it's, you know, like the Newton came out with Principia, Mathematica, etc. These old texts, did you read them in full? I mean, I, I would I would bet that, you know, so I, many people I refer read... to them, but very few read them, you know. Well, I was very lucky that Ptolemy's great book, The Almagest, had been translated into English a few years before I started this. I read that. Copernicus's work was translated into English. I read that. But the real gem, the one that really gave me immense excitement and huge pleasure was Kepler's great work on how he had discovered the laws of planetary motion. It was published in Latin in 1609 but had been translated into German. And because I'd lived in Germany for six and a half years, I knew German well. And some good lady who'd done a PhD on Kepler had donated her copy on loan to the library, the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And I was able to read Kepler's great work in, in German. And it was just an absolutely marvelous experience. And Newton could, uh, 80 years later, Newton could never have made his discoveries without what Kepler had done, building on Copernicus's and Ptolemy's work before that. Question here, um, what, what sticks out at you in reading these ancient texts like what, uh, what did you experience in reading them that would be different from reading something nowadays? In many ways, much more exciting because these were really great men who made great discoveries. Nearly everything you read, I mean, there are some very good popular science books or modern textbooks, but they don't, for me, they don't catch the excitement of the real discovery, that, that thrill particularly that Kepler and Galileo and Newton had, and Einstein for that matter. Reading the originals is, is I think, I was very lucky to, to have the privilege to do that because I decided to be independent, become an independent academic, and I earned my living by translating Russian scientific journals. And I had about a third of my time to do what I liked. Uh, so I could do that. It was wonderful. So that's, how yeah, I no, that's great. so that's how I came to write the book. And it was published in 1989. That's right. Uh, it's over 30 years ago that it was published. So then what, what was the, I think it's just a rare opportunity to speak to someone that has actually read, you know, in full these ancient texts. That's why I wanted to ask you what jumped out at you. But thank you for that. So tell me, so then what happened next? You were reading through, you were going back in time. 
and the thought processes and how did this lead to your book? Please go on. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Well, I I just thought I will change that plan. I got in touch with the editor in, uh, at Cambridge University Press and said, look, I've got <laughs> so excited with the, the prehistory of the book, I promised you. Uh, I'll do that book. So in the end, I've never actually got round to writing the book for which I had the original contract. I, I wrote a completely different book, though there was some overlap. So it did cover Newton and quite a bit of what came after Newton, up to Ernst Mach, in fact. But it didn't cover Einstein had done or the work that I'd done with Bertotti. Um, so it's in some ways, it's un unfinished work. But I've been carrying on doing other things. And I've, I've written two other books as well in the meanwhile and edited another book on, on Mach's principle. But I just get immense pleasure from the history and from trying to discover what, you know, what drove these people, how they made their discoveries and, and, and what the universe is all about. I mean, I've just, I thought this morning I was going to do some work and then I thought, hang on, I've got this discussion with you this evening. Perhaps I should read a bit of my book from that I started writing nearly 40 years ago just to refresh my memory. So basically, I more or less reread the whole of the chapter on Kepler today. And it just, it's just a fantastic story. He was an amazing scientist. We we don't, not enough people realize what a huge contribution he made to modern science. Okay. Again, what are the underlying premises of the most recent version of your thinking surrounding dynamics and the nature of space and time? Ah, well, these reading Kepler, I, I see how much Kepler in, inspired me and how much I've sort of taken over his attitude. So basically, Kepler, uh, and, and this is really behind all of my work, really, is, and, and, and Marx said the same, that, that you cannot imagine finding your way if there's nothing by which you can see your way. How do we you know, if you go out after we've had our chat and you, you've got to get home, unless you're talking, doing it from home, you have to look around and see things to see where you should go. And so that's that's called kinematic relativity. You know where you are by seeing where you are relative to other things. But then first Kepler and then Mach said, not only is that important, but also it's these other things that actually determine where you go. Kepler introduced the idea that the sun, because according to Copernicus, God had just put the sun at the center of the, of the solar system to illuminate the dance of the planets. That was what Copernicus thought. Kepler said, no, the sun must be much, much more important. It must somehow be physically controlling the motions of the planets. And he would never have found that he would never have found his laws of planetary motion if he hadn't been driven by that idea. It was absolutely crucial. And this still very much determines my ideas. My, my idea is you should say what it is that you can actually observe and put in what you can actually observe and nothing else, nothing else that's redundant. You should try and do everything with what in principle can be observed. So I illustrate this for the example of just suppose you had a universe of just three particles in, uh, in, in space, and that was your model universe. So now think about a triangle. It has a shape and a size, but to give it a size, you've got to imagine a ruler in addition to the triangle to, to put the Put it up against the triangle to see how large it is. But its shape is something which is independent of its size. So, so my collaborators and I call this. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Shape dynamics. And this is very much what is driving me at the moment. So this goes right back to to Kepler, because it's saying it, you must have things that you can uh, see that that science or that dynamics is about the way th- the things you can see change. And moreover, the things that are changing give rise to the changes. It's It's a twofold thing. And I'm just exploiting that as much as I possibly can. I've done that in my most recent book, which was was published four months ago in in the United States and in Britain. The the Janus point, the Janus point, uh, in in which I'm put forward new ideas about what it is that determines the direction of time. Well, I have a, a question here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more of a layperson, even though I've had an engineering degree. But you know, uh, space time is a curvature, and I guess mass, you know, exerts or it causes space to curve, but because space is curved, mass moves not in a straight line necessarily. But how would you communicate a model for people's minds on what space-time actually looks like uh, in a way that's understandable? Because it just feels very confusing. Well, the the most current, accurate space-time picture that you know of, how would you describe it, you know, again, in somewhat layman's terms, and how can we picture it as listeners? Well, first of all, I would say... I think Einstein's theory is right, but I think it could be expressed in a more ele- elemental form in terms of what really counts. And what I would say, so Einstein more or less reduced time to the same thing as space. He he said that, and this went back to his precursor Minkowski, who'd introduced the notion of space-time. And neither Minkowski nor Einstein really asked themselves, what is time? They just assumed it was there. A length of time for them was just like a distance of space, more or less. And Einstein, when Einstein was asked, what is time? He said, it is what clocks measure. But he didn't, he didn't have a theory of what a clock is or how they come into existence. So I think that is what one has to address. Now, it would be easier to explain how I think about space-time if, if we were doing this on a video. But I have in front of me two triangles, and they're nearly the same shape, but they're not quite. Now, the key thing, which is, I feel pretty confident, is right at the heart of Einstein's theory, but it's very well hidden, is if I want to say how much do those two triangles differ I can put one, they're not exactly the same shape or size. I can put one on top of the other and you will see that they're different. But then I can try and move them relative to each other so that the difference between them is reduced to a minimum. And I call that best matching. And that, I would say, is is how one should understand how change occurs from, from the one triangle to the next. And this can be on a much larger scale. It can be a thousand or a billion particles at two different instants. They change. And then you then for me, basically, time is not something that exists independently of those shapes. It is a measure of the difference of those shapes. So for me, there are instants of time. And if there were just three particles in the universe, it would just be the triangle that those three particles form. And then time, uh, another instant would be a slightly different triangle. And time would be the difference of the shape of those two triangles. So that's how I think about it. And you could imagine putting those triangles or a pack of cards, for example, you could imagine putting a pack of cards into the best matched position, like I described with those two triangles, moving one relative to the other until they they are as close to overlap as you can bring them. And then you can have a third triangle and a fourth and a fifth. And you can keep on moving the next one relative to the one before. So everything, you start with one at the bottom and then you keep on adding another one so that you get sort of like a pack of cards, but each is best matched relative to the previous one. And then you put a separation between them, which is a measure of how much difference there is between one to the next. And then you get something that looks like a, a pack of cards or, or a yes, a sort of a card house that's sort of held up by props, which are a measure of the difference between them. 
And then you've got something like a loaf of bread. Now, in Einstein's theory, he has that loaf of bread. And in a way, in his theory, you can slice it in any way you like. This is the principle of relativity of simultaneity. But actually, there's a, there's a, a more fundamental way in which there is a, one special way of slicing that, that loaf of bread or that pack of cards when you've created it. How would you represent the expansion of the universe, though? You know, well, if I picture a localized chunk of space, what would expansion look like? How would it distort that shape? Or, how, you know, how does the shape of the universe change with expansion? Now, I have come more and more, and this has really grown on me uh, since since I wrote my last book, and I'm now feeling it very strongly. I think we just should not say that the universe is expanding, I would say the universe is changing its shape. So let me go back to my triangle. I said that you can't say that the triangle has a size without having some ruler outside the triangle to to measure it against. But there is something in which you can say that there are sizes within the universe because the sides of the triangle are not equal. So you can say that the longest side is say four times has a length four times greater than the shortest side so there are measures of sort of size within the universe so suppose you start off with a universe in which all of the particles are sort of very so imagine a a universe which is only two-dimensional and it's closed up on itself like the surface of the earth you could start off it's a smooth ball and you could start off with a thousand particles spread as uniformly as you possibly could over the surface of that of that ball, then you could imagine their distribution changing. They're still, shall we say, on the surface of that ball, but some of the balls get closer to each other, and then there are distances between them. So if you now think that and shall we say quite a lot of them are all about the set of the shorter distances are all about the same. Then you could say there's an internal ruler within your universe. Those are the short, those, those shorter distances give you a, a ruler with which you can measure the distance to the, to the further ones. And then this will change as the shape of the universe changes. If you get more and more pairs clustering together, then the distance between the, the length that they define will can be used to measure the distance to other clusters, which will increase. So this, in fact, objectively, this is all the expansion of the universe really is in terms. Astronomers don't see the universe expanding. What they establish is that the typical diameter of a galaxy is getting smaller relative to the distance between the galaxies. So this is not any evidence that the universe is expanding relative to a ruler outside the universe. It's just saying that the shape of the universe is changing. Things are getting relatively clustered compared with the distances between these clusters. So that's what I think. I I now am arguing really increasingly strongly one should not think about the expansion of the universe, but just say it is changing its shape. And the shape is changing. I mean, I guess you define shape at the periphery, though. And I thought there is no periphery. So how do we... Well, if, well I guess, I mean, I guess not the structure. I, have, I mean, my whole, my whole scheme would be seriously threatened if the universe does not close up on itself like the surface in three dimensions as the surface of the Earth does in two. Now, this is not... Modern cosmologists think the universe is infinite and it's like a huge flat plane going on forever. But there's no absolutely firm evidence that that is the case. It, it looks as if it's true. But I think the reason why that's so popular with cosmologists is that it's much easier to do the calculations if that's the case. But uh, so I think really the, the, that need not be the case. Now, I've lost the question that you put to me before just now, Richard. What was it? Again? Well, yeah, I mean, wouldn't you, if, if you say the universe is changing shape, wouldn't you have to, in order to determine that, understand what it looks like in the periphery of it but supposedly there is no periphery or no there there is no periphery in if the if the universe closes up on itself in three dimensions as i say like the earth does in two then there is no periphery that by the way this is 
a universe that closes up on itself in three dimensions was the first cosmological model that Einstein created. And he was very attracted to that idea because in a sense, everything closes up on itself. It's a very pleasing idea that you can... Einstein said that model is very pleasing because the circle of mechanical causes and effects can be closed. And I too find it very attractive. And I mean, it is a fact that the universe, we know a split second after the Big Bang, was extremely uniform, tiny fluctuations from from perfect uniformity. And since then, it has got ever more non-uniform, more more clustered. So that overall picture that I've described does match what has been happening. We know that has been happening in the history of the universe. Yeah, I've I've been told that um, I guess you can picture the universe as like a a raisin loaf, and it's inflating and the raisins are moving away from each other. But it didn't seem to be a great picture to me. I don't know if there's any better one. Well, the the picture of the raisins moving apart from each other is quite good, but it's bad because you imagine they, well, you could say they're, they're another one is coins stuck on a balloon, which is being blown up. But the, the fact remains that that immediately leads you to think that you're seeing that balloon being blown up in the background of the room in which you're sitting or standing. But there is no room outside the universe. At least that's hard to believe there is. We don't see any sign of it. So I think that's not the right way to think about it. One one should just say the size of the universe is, the, the shape, sorry, the shape of the universe is changing. It's not getting bigger. That's That's my view. So I guess the perspective is, right, if you're inside a gigantic raisin loaf that's that's expanding. You'll have a different perspective than standing outside of it and looking at it. Well, I do, I mean, we, 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 I, mean I think that's that we, we're lost if we start thinking about looking at it from the outside. We have to take on board that we're inside that thing and we're part of it. I mean, this. I mean, one way of re- I find one way of, that's really helpful about this is to remember Alice in Wonderland and Gulliver's Travels. Size is relative. If you could either say that you are getting smaller or the universe is getting larger, but you can't choose. There's no way of saying definitely the universe is getting bigger and I'm staying the same size. All you can say is the ratio of of my size divided by what what the distance to the galaxies is just getting smaller. And you can't say that one or the other is getting bigger or smaller. All you can say is the ratio is changing. That That's, for me, inescapable. And I think cosmologists tend to forget that. It's very remarkable. So what, are we able to observe any, you know, if we're in a localized place, like, again, right outside the Earth, are we able to observe changes in essentially what it, like, is vacuum? Are we able so, to essentially the, changes in the structure of space? nearby us? Well, certainly we can. I mean, Einstein's theory describes this very wonderfully. I mean, if a, the, the, we, we clearly see how the sun changes the structure of space in the solar system as, as we move around the sun. I mean, because of the way the sun deflects light rays, From different, as the Earth moves around the sun, the positions of the stars on the sky seem to move relative to each other and to the sun. And that is now a most brilliant confirmation of Einstein's theory. But it is all relative. It is seen how one thing moves relative to another. This is going right back to, this is so close in a way to Kepler's philosophy that Science must be about how one thing changes relative to another and also the physical idea that things affect each other. That And this is in Newton's third law. Uh, every force has an equal and opposite force. So we are pulled towards the sun, but we pull the sun a tiny bit towards us. Uh, I mean, the earth does, and even <laughs> you and me do too. So... That way of thinking goes back to Kepler, and I think I think one should keep it very firmly in mind. And I, I, I my feeling, it, it is my own feeling, and it can well be wrong. Science is 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 always tentative, but my feeling is people have lost some 
contact with the real foundation of of things of, of what reality is really like and so i think it 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 certainly doesn't harm to go back and see what what people like kepler did because he prepared the way for newton and they all i mean newton said he could see so far because he stood on the shoulders of giants and that that goes for all of the six successes of science every advance in science is based on what went before said by, by reading the original texts you could probably see direct support for that statement oh yes on the shoulders it, of giants because you literally see it right? oh absolutely yes yes and as i say it's 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 very rewarding you i, I get a, a an immense amount of pleasure from it and i it's very gratifying a, a lot of people have I've said, I mean, the, my my book, The Discovery of Dynamics, I mean, that's an academic book. I think it's perhaps sold 3,000 copies in total. Yeah, I mean, secondhand copies may have been sold. I don't know how many times it's it's sort of been sold and resold, you know. And certainly something like 3,000 copies have, have uh, gone from the publishers, if not 3,500, uh, as opposed to my first popular science book, which I think sold of the order of perhaps 40,000 copies, 50,000, I don't know. So it's a different order, but but certainly it's very nice for me to know that people and some very eminent scientists have got great pleasure from reading my discovery of dynamics. So, you know, that's that's been very rewarding. Well, what are some of the current things that you're thinking about, you know, this very day? What are you working on right now? Well, the I'm now trying to take things down to, uh, to that minimum i said that when discussing kepler's work i said you should you should identify what is observable and then try and describe the universe in terms of what is observable with nothing extra nothing redundant so this was what i said in the to get things down to the absolute minimum so at the moment while I was writing my book, I was thinking about things changing and just taking the fact that they change as being the fundamental thing. But then is there something that really governs more closely the way they change that really determines the way they change? And there's a certain, I talked about the shape of the universe changing. Now, there's a certain quantity, which my collaborators and I call the complexity, this is the extent to which if you have particles, if the universe consists of particles, material particles, then the extent to which they're clustered or uniformly distributed, there's a very specific quantity which measures that quantity, and we call it the complexity. There's no doubt that it's a, a serious quantity. And in my book, The Janus Point, I explain how really this is this it's this quantity that is changing, that has been changing in the universe. And change is is what is determining the direction of time. It's not, I believe, the increase of entropy, which people have said hitherto, the, the increase of disorder. I disagree with people who say that the universe is becoming steadily more disordered. I argue in my most recent book that the universe is becoming steadily more ordered. Its, its complexity is increasing. Now, the really radical idea I'm exploring now, and if it's correct, it it really will be a huge change, but there's a huge big if behind that with lots of Fs, I, F, 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 you know, huge if. I'm now suggesting that that complexity is not just the measure of how structured the universe is, but might in some very profound sense be literally time itself. And it also might be the most important part of energy. Energy has two parts. It has what is called kinetic energy, which is a measure of how things are moving, and also what's called potential energy, which is basically the, the shape that the matter has. So if you have a universe, if you're describing the whole universe, then the way you should describe the amount of structure in the universe, what its potential energy is, those two are, I argue, the same thing. And on top of that, I'm saying that is actually also time itself. And if that's true, 
then it is it is very interesting and that really might be a big advance in science now i'm sticking my neck out there so your listeners yeah. if they remember this and see that i've been shown to be totally wrong in a year or two can have a laugh and say well julian got that one wrong but if nothing else it's, okay. it's quite an interesting idea and it's keeping me happy trying to work out the implications are there particular objects in the universe that really inform the structure of the universe like black holes are they very helpful to study or you know the vacuum oh. itself the quantum fluctuations i mean what what have you found to be helpful in your understanding of the universe well first of all let me say there's no question that black holes are very important uh, and so are vacuum fluctuations and i have to say that if there's a serious weakness in the work i've been doing it's that neither of them have been properly grasped and taken hold of. I would say that black holes might yet be, I mean, it's, it's fantastic, the work that uh, Penrose, Roger Penrose, and who just got the Nobel Prize a few months ago, and Stephen Hawking did, and others on developing the ideas about black holes, and also all the work on vacuum fluctuations. I would be an idiot to deny the significance of that. But the interesting thing about black holes is the theory of black holes that was to a large extent originally developed by Roger Penrose, it, 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 can't, it doesn't exist if the universe is, that theory can't be applied if the universe closes up on itself, is spatially closed up on itself. It requires the universe to be what is said to be asymptotically flat. And it may be, and now this, it's very difficult mathematics to try and develop a theory of, of black holes in a, in a spatially closed universe. And there's no such theory exists at the moment. And I think if ever that could be developed, that might completely change the theory of black holes. It wouldn't undermine their importance. They clearly are hugely important things in, in the overall story of the cosmos. If nothing else, they have a huge, it's absolutely clear, they have a huge influence on the structure that galaxies have because of the stuff that they spew out influences the whole structure of the, of the, of the galaxies and how stars are formed and things like that. So those are things that are need to be studied. I should say this is interesting. A few years ago, a very distinguished mathematician came to Oxford uh, to talk about Roger Penrose's work. And I spoke to him privately after he'd given his talk. And I said, all of your theorems that you've talked about, they assume that space is asymptotically flat, that it goes off essentially to infinity and, and become sort of nice and well behaved. I said, why do you not try and develop some theorems and some results for a spatially closed universe that closes up on itself, as I say, like the surface of the earth? And he said, we couldn't do the mathematics. We couldn't prove any theorems. So we're forced to make that assumption if we're going to prove any theorems. So this might just be a serious a, a way where something could be, where, where some major change could come about. And as I've been saying this, it's occurred to me, this is so reminiscent of Kepler. I'm sure Kepler would raise his hands in horror at this idea that you have some uniform flat space going out to infinity, infinitely far, which is ultimately controlling and determining things, he would say that can't be right. And I'm a bit inclined to think he may be right. So that gives me some hope I might be on the right track. Very good. What's the best way for people to find out more about your work? And when's your next book coming out? Well, it's already out. The, this book, the Janus point, like the Roman god Janus, who looks in two opposite directions at once, that was published at the start of December by Basic Books in the United States. And that's, I would say it's at the serious end of the popular science genre. It, it's, I, take, I take the reader through the whole lot. And while, I, I mean, it took me four years to write that book, partly because there was a sort of crisis in the family in the middle of it. But 
my ideas were developing all the time. And right at the end of writing that book, I came to this really radical new idea about what time is. And after some hesitation, I, I fitted it in towards the end of the book. So it's there. So if your listeners want to take it on, I'll, I'll be delighted. Uh, I'm told by my editors that it is uh, selling quite well. And in fact, in the, the main bookshop in Oxford, in, in Blackwell's, it's it's all over the place. It's on it's on the science bestseller's shelf, uh, on the second shelf underneath Bill Gates's book. So that's quite encouraging. So people are obviously buying it. So I'll be absolutely delighted if if uh, your listeners try it. Otherwise, there's quite a lot of things on uh, online on YouTube. There was a very nice interview on YouTube by the organisation called Closer to Truth that came out just before my book was published that's had a really good lot of views i can't remember how many it is now is it about 80,000 or something so that's nice and and there are there are a few more and there are older ones where i've been putting forward my ideas so yeah they mm. they don't have to buy the book and 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 wade through uh, all the pages they they can nibble at it without actually getting the book and there's also um there's an article by me uh, on the online magazine in the States, Nautilus, which I which seems to be doing quite well. The, in fact, the editors have got a journalist to come and interview me to write up a bit more detailed about my ideas. And that's going to appear on that thing. Nautilus is, is the thing there. So they, they can look at that or read it. Yeah, no, that's great. I did want to ask you one more thing. I, I just realized what concept or concepts in, fig- fig- in physics, I don't know, like just completely mystify even you even with all your knowledge and background and training, what, what, what would that mi- be? What, what, really, what really mystify me? Yeah, this moment, after all the time you've spent and things you've read and the work you've done after all these years, you know, what, what concepts really just, you find that you have a, even you have a very hard time even beginning to grasp? I certainly, unfortunately, I'm not at all good on quantum field theory, which is where all this business with quantum fluctuations comes in. That's a weakness. The evidence for quantum fluctuations is strong. But on the other hand, there's a great mystery why the universe hasn't collapsed down to a size of a, a grapefruit, because the the expected gravitational effect of vacuum, vacuum fluctuations would be much bigger. So there's there's certainly lots of mysteries in in cosmology, which is, I mean, cosmology is marvelous at the moment. These big telescopes and the new discoveries that are being made with gravitational wave detectors and things. It's 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 a wonderful story. I I wish I knew more things than I, I do, that's for sure. But but maybe it's there may be some virtue in going your own way and trying to find out your own things. I mean there's I would say there's a small chance I might be onto something. Uh, and if nothing else, I've enjoyed really trying to find out these things and write about them. I okay. Th- yeah, no, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And, and I, do yeah, hope you, I do hope your listeners have had got some interest out of it. Excellent. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.